Forget worrying about a run on the banks. Nothing says economy in crisis like a run on the job fair. The Nashua Telegraph newspaper in Nashua, New Hampshire reports today on a statewide jobs fair that advertised about 1,000 jobs available. They expected a big turnout and they arranged bus transit from a nearby mall for about 600 people per hour. Instead, more than 10,000 people showed up in the first two hours. And that doesn't count the people who turned back when they saw the crowds and the lines. The event eventually had to be shut down early as lines of job seekers snaked across the campus of Southern New Hampshire University and people hoping to get on those shuttle buses uh, to the, from the parking lots of the Mall of New Hampshire brought both sides of Route 293 to a debilitating standstill. So welcome to today's visual representation of our imperiled economy and the still rising unemployment rate. That rate is one of the things that everybody seems to get about this economic crisis amid a complicated amalgam of bad economic problems and all the different proposals being floated to fix those problems. Unemployment is pretty simple. It's a fairly uncomplicated, easy to understand one that has been kicking the country in the teeth since this current economic meltdown was just a twinkle in the old downturn's eye. Of all the economic tools President Obama and his team have employed in the past few months, the one most specifically tailored to counteracting unemployment has, of course, been the stimulus bill. Republican governors like Alaska's Sarah Palin, Louisiana's Bobby Jindal, and South Carolina's Mark Sanford have been trying to make political hay by standing up against the stimulus bill. But now they're finding it politically impossible to actually literally turn down all the cash. Politico.com's Ben Smith reports that all three have now submitted letters to the White House saying they would please like to be eligible for those federal funds that they've been railing about. Trying to save face, Governor Sanford's political allies have paid for a video in which the governor defends his stance, sort of, against the stimulus. Going further into debt will not solve a problem that was created by too much debt. So he's against the stimulus money. He'll probably be accepting anyway because it will worsen this economic crisis that was created by debt. The crisis we're in is because of debt. Really? Joining us now, Adam Davidson and Alex Bloomberg, hosts of the Planet Money podcast from NPR, two non-economist, relatively normal reporter guys known for explaining the economy and the current crisis to other regular people in an understandable way. Gentlemen, thank you for being on the show tonight. Thank you for having us. I hope I did not bother you by calling you relatively normal. Governor Mark Sanford says this economic crisis was created by debt. I don't get that. Is he right? Yeah, he's right about that. Okay. It, um, basically, over the last uh, 10 years, the world changed a lot. One of the ways the world changed was the U.S. got U.S. consumers got into so much more debt than they had ever gotten into before. Uh, well, in a, in a long time. Uh, a lot of that was household, you know, buy, buying homes. A lot of it was credit card debt and other things like that. And that certainly created the conditions for the crisis. It doesn't explain the whole crisis, but it's, it's a reasonable explanation. He, he means, though, that it's the national deficit, I think. Oh, I don't, I don't know what he means. It's, it's hard to tell what kind of debt he was talking about. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of debt. Right. Um, uh, if I could take a moment and talk about my favorite chart that I've seen recently. Please, go, <laughs> I know, go. I know this is the kind of show where you can do that, right? There's a, I was talking to a, a finance professor at, at Columbia, and he showed me this, the, his, his favorite chart, which has now become my favorite chart, which is a chart of uh, household debt in this country over the last hundred years. And household debt is like everything that you owe on your credit card and your mortgage and on your car, everything. And if you add up everything that everybody owes in the country and put it all together, that's what, the, that's what household debt is. And then this chart was as a percentage of GDP. Okay. So the chart is sort of like goes up and up and up and up over the decades and then it, like, it, it crests. It goes sharply up in the 2000s. It crests at 2007 mm. at 100% of GDP which means that every uh, we collectively as a nation, this is not corporate debt, this is not government debt, we collectively as people owe $13 trillion on our heart, cars and credit cards, 100% of GDP. Last time that happened, uh, 1929. Oh, when something else bad happened. Yeah. 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 Is there any way that it could be argued, and I'm thinking about the tea parties now, mm -hmm. which I'm going to be talking about again in just a moment after you guys are safely out of the room because I'm worried that I'm going to bust up talking about it like I did last time. Is there any way in which the idea of the government running a deficit or accumulating debt uh, in, to the extent that they did during, I don't know, the Bush administration or say during the Clinton years when there was a surplus, is there any way that that can be blamed for the crisis that we're in? 
Um, it, I, I don't think that can be blamed for... Yes, there is a way it can be planned. I'm thinking <laughs> it through. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, another one of the ways in which the world changed that made this whole crisis happen is, uh, is the specific nature of our debt. We, we were, as a nation, spending about 3 to 6%, depending on the year, more than we as a nation made. And that is adding everything, the companies, the government, the people. And we were borrowing that money famously from China, from mm -hmm. Japan, from other places. And that created a distortion in how money moved around the world and it's a little complicated to explain right now, but it basically created a distortion that 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 um, that that inflated this debt bubble um, that that then burst, and we're now paying the price. So, if you want to get really mad, you have to blame the systemically created debt distortion. You, you have to blame, yeah, yeah, China and Japan and America and consumers and the banks. And in finance economics, where um, debt became something that um, was the basis of well, trading and all sorts of financial engineering um, is something else that people who are worried about the economic crisis but don't understand about a lot of economics, a lot about economics worry about too. What about deregulation in the financial industry? What about the different things that could be traded uh, that couldn't be traded before, different types of institutions that couldn't exist before that did exist after deregulation in the 90s? This is something that, I mean, it's really hard to like point a finger at like this. I mean, you can find people who will do that, who will say this, it was this deregulation at, at this moment that caused this crisis. Um, we're not those people, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but uh, but there, th I, I think there, is, there, were, there was a number of financial instruments that were created that, that became very popular. They weren't created, but they became very, very popular in the late 90s, early 2000s that weren't looked at very closely. And Maybe if somebody had been looking at them more closely, some of these problems could have been could have been solved. And Probably. Lo looked at meaning policed? Potentially. I mean, I think what Alex and I often say is it's not so much that there was too little regulation, it's that there was too uneven regulation. There were parts, like running a bank, you are really, really regulated. There's this idea that, you know, Ronald Reagan just made banks you could go crazy, do whatever you want. It's not like that at all. Running a bank is tough. You have a lot, a lot, a lot of rules. But running an investment bank or a hedge fund is very easy. You have very few rules. I mean, I'm sure it's hard to do, but as far as the government's concerned. And it was this mismatch where you have, like, really heavy regulation in one area and no regulation or very little in another area, that creates distortions too. So it's not so much more or less, but more even and maybe smarter regulation. Well, it seems like that would also be the problem when you have consumer banks, investment banks, insurance companies all becoming the same institution. Then you can sort of internally trade your level of I think risk that's, and that's regulation. a story a lot of people are saying yeah. that there was this decision in you know, um, 1998, 1999 to um, repeal Glass-Steagall. I, I, I think the evidence isn't persuasive that that was sort of a that was the one cause, like Alex was saying. I think that, you know, that's one factor among a lot of factors. But, but there is, I mean, you know, there, there is a sense that, like, there was, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, 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 a sector of the financial services industry, uh, industry where, you could, where, where you could take on excessive leverage, where there wasn't very much regulation, and that is a lot of, that's where a lot of bad things did happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the credit default swap arena that did bring down AIG, that did sort of, Pile on problems that and is costing us. Mortgage-backed securities too? No, I think mortgage-backed securities are honestly. I think they're a wonderful thing. They should be around for a long time. Yeah, mortgage-backed yeah. securities yeah, were around for a long time, and, and, the, the, and they, they well. as by themselves, did not do this. But it was it was the sort of the, it was the it was the um, the craziness that went. All, that there were certain banks that went crazy and so with them. But the, the idea isn't that bad. So all of the things that I thought were usefully explanatory in terms of what's happened, in terms of not making the mistakes, again, you've now told me, don't apply at all. I'm not saying you don't, don't apply. But I, but I, <laughs> don't apply at all, don't explain anything, but I don't understand what does explain anything. No, no, so. no. Well, I spent the day, by coincidence, with this fabulous uh, cancer researcher at Yale, and he was explaining to me how a cell becomes cancerous. And things happen badly in cells all the time. And if two things or four things or five things happen badly, the, the body knows how to deal with it. It's when six or 10 or 12 things happen that you get runaway cancer. And I think, you know, that's this kind of crisis. We try and explain it as simply as possible, but unfortunately, it isn't a simple story. It's a lot, a lot of different things happened that caused this cancer, I guess I'll go for it. Um, and, and, I, you know, I think for us, you know, picking like, oh, it's these Democrats or these Republicans or this decision point or this moment, if only, if only they knew, it's not like that. It's for 20 years, 
all the people in charge of our economy, from journalists to regulators to politicians to people overseas, did not, they all did a bunch of things that seemed like a decent idea at the time, and it led to this crisis. And unfortunately, it's not, it's that, it's that simply <laughs> so not the, simple. The way out of this is everybody shouldn't do things that seem like a reasonable way forward. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. There yeah, are yeah, villains, yeah. but it's mostly a, not a villainless story, or a single villainless story. Adam Davidson, Alex Bloomberg, host of the Planet Money podcast from NPR. Thank you for coming in. I feel much worse than when I started talking to you, but I don't know why. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's our job. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear more from Alex and Adam when they make their debut on Meet the Press this Sunday on NBC. Wear a Snuggie. Check local listings for times. All right.